Good afternoon and welcome to the second lecture of the 2013 Food for Thought Luncheon Lecture Series. I'm Mary Kay Cooper, Senior Director of Alumni Relations here at the University. This series is sponsored by the San Antonio Alumni Chapter and coordinated by the Alumni Office. The series is designed to spotlight Trinity's outstanding faculty. Before we get to today's talk, though, I would like to tell you about an upcoming event. On February 25th, Dr. Robert Elin will give a talk on opening a Civil War time capsule, the recovery and excavation of the Civil War Confederate submarine, H.L. Hunley. The talk begins at 7.30 p.m. in Northrop Hall, room 040, and the event is free and open to the public. We're pleased to have several special Trinity people with us today, and I want you to be able to recognize them. They are President Dennis Alberg, his wife Penelope Harley, Vice President for Alumni Relations and Development, Lisa Baronio. <laughs> Vice President for Faculty and Student Affairs, Michael Fisher. <laughs> Welcome all. I want to remind everyone that this program is being recorded so that people all over the world can view or listen to it later. So during the question and answer period, please come to the microphone to ask your question. Our speaker will be introduced by James Sanders, class of 1998. James is the president of the San Antonio Alumni Chapter and a financial advisor with Morgan Stanley. James? I always feel a bit awkward at the applause. Well, thank you, Mary Kay. I'm James Sanders, president of the San Antonio Chapter, and this is a great turnout. Uh, aren't these food for thought lectures great? I just absolutely love them. I'm happy to be able to kind of come to two or three of you and introduce the speakers. So, the last time we heard uh, the professor of music, music education, Dr. Diane Perslin, uh, speak was at a food for thought lecture, and she was sharing her music education research with us about the Mozart effect and if music could make us smarter, which is what we hope so. Uh, Dr. Purcellin has published over 100 articles and book chapters in the area of music education and recently organized an early childhood music conference in Greece. She has been inducted into the San Antonio Women's Hall of Fame for the work of the San Antonio Symphony's education program. Many of us have heard Diane's Trinity handbell ensemble perform on campus with the San Antonio and with the San Antonio Symphony. But we may not know that she has served on the staff of the Summer Teaching and Learning Workshop, sponsored by the Associated Colleges of the South, which is now held on Trinity's campus each June. Her new guidebook on research-based instructional strategies for college instructors, uh, to college instructors, developed from this workshop. Diane also co-chaired the committee that developed a new collaborative for learning and teaching for the Trinity faculty. So, would you please help me welcome Dr. Burson. Thank you, James. Can you all hear me in the back? The sound is good? Good, thank you. I want to thank the alumni chapter and the um, Office of Alumni and Mary Kay for inviting me to be with you here today. And um, as James mentioned, the last time I was with you he, um, here about eight years ago or so, we um, discussed whether Mozart could indeed make us smarter and we came to a good conclusion. So I'm sure you all remember that very well. <laughs> Today, I'm bringing with me another question for you. Is our teaching as effective as it could be? So that's our quandary for today. Well, back in the 14th century, teaching was a lot more difficult than it is today. And I, I like to call this professor Professor Blue Robes, because he's having kind of a tough day in the classroom, as you can see. Here's Professor Blue Robes up in the lectern. And um, Laurentius de Voltolina is the painter here. And he was painting what was happening in this medieval university 
Um, and we have some problems with the scholars. We see some sleepy scholars here, some whispering back here, nodding off, wondering how long is this lecture going to go on and on. <laughs> Notice that um, Professor Blue Robes, as I call him, is just reading from his script. And that's basically how we used to teach back in the 14th century. We would just read from the scroll um, hand copied books because Amazon.com didn't exist then. And this was, of course, way before Trinity University was in operation. So 2013, however, is a very exciting time to be a college professor. We now know so much more about learning and how people learn. The profession is now moving away from focusing on teaching strategies, such as learning or just from teaching from the lectern, to now focusing more on learning. So a better topic for my uh, talk today could be, are our students learning as effectively and deeply as they could be? And that's going to be the focus of my talk today about deep learning. Well, we had an old teaching paradigm compared to the new learning paradigm. We're going to contrast and compare these two paradigms. So we have over on the left the teaching paradigm where the focus was primarily on improving the quality of instruction. Compared to the learning paradigm, the focus is going to be on improving the quality of learning. Back over in the teaching paradigm, the transfer knowledge to students. Dr. Blue Robes was just trying to hand over what he knew to his students. Whereas the learning paradigm now, students discover and construct their own knowledge. And the teaching paradigm instructors are primarily lectures. That's their role. And now we're moving into a learning paradigm where instructors are designers of learning methods and environments. And I must admit, when I started teaching, not quite back in the 14th century, but it seems like some, some of my students would like to say that's probably where I started, we were focusing more on the teaching paradigm more than the learning paradigm. But as I said, 2013 is a very exciting time to be a professor. I've been on the staff of the ACS Teaching and Learning Workshop for 19 years, and um, I've become fascinated with how people learn. I also have been preparing teachers for 36 years, so I've been very interested about how uh, people learn. We used to call um, what I do teacher trainers. We were training students. We train dogs. Now we know we prepare teachers, so there's, there's a difference. So. I'm not a neuroscientist or a cognitive scientist, but I love to watch how people learn and how they get it. So I'm kind of a student of, of, of learning. I like to think of it that way. And to this end, I've co-authored a guidebook that has taken what we know about how people learn from the neuro and cognitive scientists and written applications based on this knowledge about how we can bring that into the classroom. And I met a couple of um, principals and K-12 educators as we were going through the line, and I said, you folks know all about this. We've been doing this at the K-12 level for quite a while. We know about hands-on active learning. And college, we're, we're now learning much more about that as well. So um, it's, again, very exciting. So I'm not going to share all the nitty-gritty deep citations from the neuroscience literature with you today. If you're wondering where a specific citation came from, come on up afterwards and I'm happy to share that with you um, in my guidebook or shoot me an email. That would be great too and I'd be happy to share that. So faculty, I'm finding, are very interested in these principles of teaching and learning, but there's so much to do. It's just so hard to keep up with our own disciplines as well as keep up with the neuroscience and the cognitive science about teaching and learning. So um, they're eager to learn, but I think that's another good reason why we have to have some excellent resources today. My first principle, we need to get going on this, is multisensory instruction and learning increases attention and keep, increases retention as well. Multisensory learning stimulates several senses. We like to think in music, we've known about this for a long time, because in music, we're singing, we are conducting, we are moving, we are thinking and analyzing, we're playing instruments. But now we have evidence from the neuroscientists that 
Um, neuroscience colleagues say that um, this really can increase retention in all disciplines, hands-on active research and active learning. Multisensory learning stimulates several senses, which allows the brain to encode a memory much more deeply. And that's what we're going for, more deep learning, rather than the surface learning that's just going to get us through the exam a few days later. The key is the more elaborately we encode a memory, the deeper the learning will be, as the brain has to work harder to process information. And I'm kind of um, simplifying this a little bit, the brain working harder. But the more richly we can encode that memory, the brain works harder to process it. Approaching a concept from multiple angles strengthens our overall understanding. Our senses worked to work together, they evolved to work together. So we learn best if we stimulate several senses at the same time. One of my favorite quotes is by um, the neuroscientists Chickering and Gamson. Learning is not a spectator sport. Students do not learn by sitting in class, listening to teachers, memorizing prepackaged assignments, or spitting out answers. They must talk about what they are learning. They must write about it. They have to relate it to past experiences and apply it to their daily lives. They must make what they learn a part of themselves. And I think that's really what we're about today. So, I'm not talking so much about learning styles either. That was kind of, we lost um, that, that fell out of favor a few years ago, that matching visual learners to visual teaching. I have a few students who come to class and say, Dr. P, I'm a visual learner, so everything I need to learn today needs to be visual. That fell out of favor. We found that really isn't the case. I'm talking about deep learning through multiple senses. I'm talking about encoding it in multiple ways. So. How does this work in the classroom? Well, for example, a professor may open with a question or a mini lecture, 10 to 12 minutes, and then reboot, reboot the class with a discussion, a one minute paper. I love three by five cards. It's not very high tech, but I love little cards saying, OK, you've, we've just talked about this for 10 minutes. Write about your response to this. So you're getting another modality going. Role playing. I know some of my colleagues in political science um, like to have active role playing in their classes to make things come alive. A game. I love Jeopardy. So when we have to review something like um, some history of music education or learning theories, we often will play Jeopardy. And students love it because they're actively engaged. It's a hands-on type thing and they get into groups. Um, a case study. Many of my colleagues like to use case studies as well too. <coughs> Make, um, oh, this is from John Medina, who has written a book that may, many of you may know. It's a popular book called Brain Rules. And he really is an advocate of rebooting the brain, rebooting the class every 10 minutes. And this can happen just by asking another question, just shifting gears, switching modalities one of these ways, or just trying to kind of shake up the energy in the class. He said after 10 minutes, college students are more polite, and they'll still look like they're paying attention, but their interest can kind of flag. Making it relevant is so important, and we know that here at Trinity, where we have experiential learning, we have hands-on learning, um, getting out into the community and doing service learning. We're doing more and more of that all the time, and we can see that it's very relevant, and we have a rich um, community here, too, where that can happen. And a really easy way to make things happen in the classroom is just to add pictures. We have some research on that that um, if I'm just talking at you, a few days later, you'll remember 10% of what you heard. But if I add pictures, like the Alamo or like this picture of the brain, it really increases dramatically up to 65% in some studies. So that's quite dramatic. A little case study about that, and I'm sure you all have case studies about that too when you were in college just a few years ago. Um, I didn't go to Trinity, I didn't have that opportunity, but um, I loved my music classes when I was an undergraduate at college. And I paid pretty close attention in my music classes. When I left the music building, it was less consistent. But I adored my art history class. I loved the pictures. They were colorful, they were vibrant, and the professor told stories about each of the pictures and made it real. 
and I just adored that. I went back and I would draw my own little versions of the pictures and do flashcards. We would discuss them. It was a great class. I'd go to the next building, though, the next day, and it was Western Civilization. And I suspect, this was a very good professor, I'm sure, but he just read his yellowed notes, like Professor Bluegown did as well. And I can't remember much of anything from that class because we never saw a picture, we never had a discussion, he never had a case story. It, it was just, it didn't engage me. So what I remember back just a few years ago, at that class, I was just really s struggling to stay awake much more than my art history. I can tell you a lot about what I remember from art history because those pictures are still in my mind. Some of my class, uh, my colleagues rather, are saying, I really want to do more of this interaction in class, but I have a content-rich field where there are so many wonderful things that I want to share with my students and that they want to learn. So what they're doing, some of you um, have heard that D David Ribble is doing this. He shared a really nice talk um, at the Collaborative for Learning and Teaching last year about how he's flipping the classroom or using the reverse lecture where he is posting just a 10-minute lecture where he's talking over some um, PowerPoints or a short video. He posts that on the Trinity website. And then he comes to class, and the students might have a low stakes, like a three-point quiz or something when they enter, an entrance quiz type thing. And then they have more opportunity in class for discussion, for debate, for hands-on type things, rather than taking the whole class for lecture. And that's really working very well. So this is a popular technique. So I'd like you to take a minute and think about a time when you have learned something through several of your senses, whether it be auditory, whether it be visual, hands-on, writing. It could be when you learn to play an instrument, I hope, um, when, you, um, when you learn to speak a second language, when you were learning to cook something new, something that was multi-sensory and why it was really rich. So think about that for a minute. Minutes up? Okay. <laughs> I want you to turn to a couple of the people near you, and I'll just give you a couple minutes to share these ideas and share your ideas and then why you think that they were so meaningful and rich and why they were multi-sensory. So um, you've got a couple minutes, and I'll listen for the signal when I bring you back. <laughs>
music in there somehow. <laughs> Let me put that over there. Thank you. So it was fun to talk to each other too, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. And our college students love to talk to each other as well. Several of you were saying, but we were doing a lot of this and we were teaching kindergarten and first grade. Yes, but now we realize that a lot of what we were doing innately with young children, we need to do in college too, more hands-on in discussion. So I was hearing lots of good discussions. Who can share one of the ideas that you came up with at your, your table when you were learning something through multisensory? So Penelope, you jumped right in. What, what were you sharing? <laughs> um, well, as some of you know, and those of you who live in Monte Vista will rapidly find out, oh, um, uh, Benjamin and I have been learning the bagpipes for the last year, and we have a splendid instructor at the Josephine Theatre who um, works for the Department of Transport, and obviously there's a, a clear um, connection there. But he gave us a splendid book on how to learn, you know, a, a book that you know, showed you the scales and so on, but that was reinforced by the CD at the back, and certainly in the early months when we were learning, when we were going around Europe last summer, somehow the fantastic technology department, Matthew Miller here, managed to get that CD onto my iPhone, and Benjamin and I listened to it like a mantra in learning the tunes. And now, the gift of that is that as we are practicing those tunes, and very soon we will be playing them on a full set of bagpipes, which are now residing in the kitchen of 150, um, <laughs> we are self-directed. At the moment, it's just a horrible noise on the full set, but you will be hearing it soon. Anyone who lives within a five-mile radius. <laughs> um, Thank you. Forewarned. <laughs> OK. Do we have an example in the back? I think I have to stand next to you from the microphone. So, this is my, this is my husband. <laughs> Your example was well taken of multisensory uh, emphasis on learning. Anatomy dissection lab. The cadaver is <laughs> soaked in formaldehyde and phenol. Not only am I reading the text on what to do, I'm doing it and I'm inhaling it, and I'll remember it forever. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Do we have another story, another example? All righty. So, well, thank you for sharing that, and it gave us really a good chance to meet everybody else at the table, too, and to make things more concrete. So, let me go to my second principle. My second principle of learning, I have um, the three out of the six that I'm presenting today, that e learning infused with emotion is stronger. That emotion gets our attention, doesn't it? So our memories retain these charged events much longer than if we don't have emotion involved with it. So um, a short little quiz here. I want you to recall where you were a week ago Tuesday. What were you doing a week ago Tuesday? <laughs> oh, we've got somebody who really has a good memory there. <laughs> okay. What about where were you and what were you doing June 21st? Oh, that's oh, well, if it's your birthday or your anniversary. Okay, okay. <laughs> which, which leads to the next one. The evening of your last birthday, what were you doing? <laughs> This is a tough crowd. <laughs> okay. And what were you doing? Where were you the day of the 9-11 tragedy? So, yeah, you remember that. I'm expecting that most of you, if you're like most of my students, that evening of your last birthday and the day of the 9-11 tragedy, you remember that pretty well. It was pretty dramatic because it was just infused in emotion, wasn't it? So most of you, unless it was your birthday or anniversary, or unless you have a really keen memory, your memory of where you were a week ago Tuesday or June 21st is going to be a little fuzzier because we won't have the emotion that is surrounding those events. So well, why is this? Well, the neuroscientists again are telling us that positive and successful learning activities stimulate the brain to reward itself through the release of the neurotransmitters, and I like to call them chemical messengers, so, such as dopamine and serotonin. And these are the good guys. When we are learning things that we like and we're having a good time, dopamine and serotonin are released. We used to think that having fun in class, we don't want to use the word fun, but if you're having fun, you're more engaged and you're going to learn it longer and better and more deeply, right? 
So instructors can create learning environments that provoke positive emotional responses from students. And if they're learning positively and surrounded with um, emotionally charged events, they're going to learn a lot more deeply, like I did with my art history class. So, so how do we make this work in a classroom? Well, there are many ways we can do this. A positive attitude and passion for a topic. I bet if you think back to when you were an undergraduate, you can recall some professors who were so passionate about their topic, who loved what they were doing, that the class just came alive then because it was so much fun just to hear about their passion and their interest and excitement about learning. I think that we can share that too. Baiting the hook with concise narratives. Baiting the hook is John Medina's term again, that um, we can bait the hook and grab their attention with short narratives, short case histories, and some of my colleagues do this really well through storytelling, and everybody loves a good story. Review games, like My Jeopardy. My students love to play Jeopardy. It's fun. They're often leaving class saying, oh, that was really fun. Hopefully, they're remembering what they need to remember, too, through the Jeopardy games. And any kind of drama, humor, surprise, bring a handbell in to bring them back. <laughs> so so you're, you're actually getting more emotion involved in the classroom. Before I give you my third principle, I want to um, describe the experiment, because I, if I give you the principle first, you'll know how to vote. So we're going to be voting with our paper ballots on the table, so you might want to make sure everybody has access to a paper ballot. This is low-tech clickers type thing. Okay, and make sure you can figure out how to vote A, B, C, or D. Mm -hmm. Everybody has one? I think I had enough for everybody. Okay. Let me tell you about the experiment, and I'm slightly simplifying the experiment because um, just for sake of time, and they ran the study like three or four different times, and each time it was a little bit different, but basically this is how the big experiment went. And some of you may have read about this. It was in the popular press, too. Um, Carpick and Blunt did this series of experiments and published this in 2011. So 200 students were asked to read a paragraph and take a, sh a short-term exam on it and then a, a, um, an exam a week later. But the, 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 400, the 200 students were divided into four different groups, and each of the four groups had one way to learn the information in the paragraph. Simple recall and then inferences too in more detail. So um, you will get to vote about which of the four ways you think the students learn the best. So get ready to vote, A, B, C, or D. You can vote early and often because we're in Texas. So here, <laughs> here are your four options. Group A, the students read the paragraphs for five minutes. And then they were asked afterwards, as they were all four groups, did you understand the material? Oh, yes. They took a short quiz. They did fine. Group B, the students read the same paragraphs four times for five minutes, so they had repetition going for them this time. Do you understand? Yes, they did well on the short term quiz. Group C, students read the same material again, but this time this group created diagrams or concept maps and they were trying to do relationships, so they were interacting with the material a little bit more. And group D, the students read the paragraphs, and then they took short quiz. It's called a retrieval practice test, or a short quiz in what they had just read, and um, asked if they remembered what they did, and that, that type of thing. So your options are, let me review them again, A, just reading through, B, reading, but you get lots of practice, or you get um, several repetitions, C, you're drawing diagrams, maps, concept maps, or D, you're taking a quiz on that, a practice quiz before you take the big, huge test the following week. Remember, all four of these ways worked really well immediately. Students remembered everything right away, but a week later they were called back in and they had to take a test on simple recall and inference. Okay, you ready to vote? Okay, show me your answers. Oh my goodness, look at, look around. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of C. Can you all look around? Seeing a lot of C, some B's, some D's. Okay. And the answer is, wait for it. 
<laughs> the answer is D. Oh, the retrieval practice quiz. So, well, let's look at each one of these. So, let's look at the study. Just reading it. I didn't think I saw any A's. Did we see any A's? So, just reading a passage. No, the A's didn't work very well. The repeated study, that worked a lot better than just one time through, didn't it? And this is just simple recall, this is inference. Concept mapping, diagramming, yes, it worked better, about similar to repeated study, but when they had to review, or they had to take that quiz and figure out what they didn't know and what they did know, the brain had to work harder, and so the retention was a lot better. So, how can we use this in real life? Well, next time if you're taking your driver's test, which probably you won't have to be doing that again, you need to take a practice quiz. Or if you're helping a grandson or a granddaughter study, have a practice test before they take the real one. Otherwise, if we're just reading through things, it just seems too obvious, doesn't it? And even if we were manipulating, the, uh, actually the investigators were surprised. They thought the concept mapping and diagramming really would be the best because they were actually working with the material. But the testing really proved to be the most beneficial for long-term recall. So this leads to my third principle. Learning is facilitated by formative assessment practices. And by formative assessment, I'm referring to mini quizzes, self-tests, low-stakes evaluations that give students and instructors feedback about the learning. So the little three-point quiz that I'll have students take when they enter, a little exit quiz, just three points. I might not even grade, but students have to recall the information right away to help solidify it. So. Um, as opposed to summative assessment, that's going to be the big final exam at the end of the class. And by that point, it's almost too late to, to really pull that back together again because it really counts. So the, um, the formative assessment we're finding works really well for recall. So some more examples of low stakes or formative assessment. The voting devices, uh, paper or electronic. Many of you have seen the clickers, the electronic clickers, and that um, is fancier and you can actually see the voting that goes up on the screen, so that's another way. But these little paper um, voters work pretty well, too, and they're much easier on the budget, Dr. Alberg. So. <laughs> the one-minute entrance or exit papers, the short quiz, that can give the student immediate feedback, like, oh my gosh, I skimmed through that passage and I don't know anything, or yeah, I really understand it, and the instructor can really gain understanding, too. Student created and shared flashcards, it's very old fashioned, but that works really well. And it's just simple questions in class with immediate feedback, that can work really well. We can't just discount that. That will ask a question of the whole class or individuals. And then um, posing a question and think, pair, share. We did kind of a think, pair, share earlier where I gave you a question, you thought about the answer. Now discuss it with somebody at your table and then share that out and that also is a good way of assessing really thinking a little bit more deeply about something and I like debates a structured debate where you really have to analyze what you know and what you don't know so we have more effective learner-centered learning and teaching through these three principles and they are multi-sensory instruction and learning. And I really want to stress the learning. In fact, um, learning is so important now in the uh, teaching and learning world that when we were coming up with the title for the collaborative for learning and teaching, Dr. Albrecht said, it has to be learning and teaching. Learning has to come first. We can teach all we want, but if we don't really learn, what are we doing? So we quickly grasped onto that title. So it's now the collaborative for learning and teaching. Learning infused with emotion, because that will last longer, it'll be deeper learning. And formative assessment, where we're constantly quizzing ourselves or we're quizzing our students to see how much we've learned and get the feedback. Well, we think, <laughs> poor <laughs> Professor Blue Robes, if he, we think it's a he in this case with that big beard, if he had known more about brain research and these wonderful principles of learning, we think the students would have been more engaged and they wouldn't have voted with their feet and they would have stayed in the pews, right? Because we think they finally fell asleep, they went down to the refectory or the pub or wherever they went so to um, probably study. But we think that there's a lot more that we could learn. So, so the question is, what about Trinity University faculty? 
Do they use these learner-centered teaching and learning strategies? Yes, and more so all the time because we're becoming very excited about how our students learn. So, and I want to stress that I think most of you know how much support we have here at Trinity, that we're just very um, blessed to have so much support um, throughout the campus. The Collaborative for Learning and Teaching, which um, I had a part in developing, Barbara McAlpine did too, my partner in crime. And now we have uh, our first director, Dr. Sean Conan, who is now on campus um, directing our Collaborative for Learning and Teaching. It's a very exciting space where we can have conversations about learning and teaching, what works for us, bring in outside speakers. It's just, um, it's a really exciting time to be at Trinity with our, this, new, um, this, this new organization. The ACS Teaching and Learning Workshop, we're in our 21st year and we're sending our faculty to this um, event every year and we're so delighted it's now at Trinity. And um, faculty study groups where we read a book together about teaching and learning and discuss and debate it and bring our own experiences to the, to the group. And a superb technology support. I think I am an example of our superb <laughs> technology support today. I am all wired for sound and um, our excellent library. And then probably the most important thing is that um, the recognition here at Trinity University that teaching is really important. It really is stressed and it really is why we're here. So I think I said earlier we, in my opening remarks that it's a very exciting time to be a college professor in 2013. Um, I love my job and all the support that I get and all that I'm learning about it. Um, we now know so much more about how we learn and how we don't. We see every day that if we make our teaching and learning multi-sensory, if we infuse it with emotion, and if we create many opportunities for formative assessment throughout our classes, our students do indeed learn more deeply. So I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions. This is the best part. <laughs> Lights go on. Glenda takes the microphone. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for all the work you do, particularly with Anvil Farm, because you have given us so much pleasure and joy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Some people who are supposed to have a lot of expertise say that one of the best things for a young child to do is to learn music because that's their introduction to fractions. And I started studying violin when I was six years old. <clears throat> and I learned about whole notes and half notes and quarter notes and so on and so forth. And it was easy to transfer that into math later on. The other thing that uh, happened to me through the years, I did study violin for 16 years and I did an awful lot of memorizing music during that time. And I think it helped me really develop a facility that sometimes I think is a curse rather than a blessing because I just never forget anything. So, <laughs> but saying that, I'm wondering, what can we do as private citizens to encourage our schools to do more about putting things back in the budget for music education? I think it's sad that the children of today are not getting the public school education in music that I had the advantage of when I was growing up. Well, what a great question is that. So I think that music is one of the best ways to learn I want to say everything, that because of course I'm a music educator so I would, would strongly support that. I think one of the best things we can do is to write to our congressmen. I think they are the ones in Austin who are making those decisions um, right now even as we speak. And to make our voices heard um, loud and clearly. We're having so much um, stress, so much pressure on testing that um, sometimes the arts are getting the, the short end of the stick and so I think that we need to speak up and say the arts are important. We also learn about who we are as people, who we are in our world 
and it's a great way to learn about everything, memorizing, fractions, um, people, literature, our history. It's, um, it's really important and I think that sometimes that message gets lost in um, the um, high stakes testing. So I think it's a good question. I think that, uh, that our congressmen really do listen and they read their mail, so I hear. <laughs> Thank you. This is not exactly on the subject of education, but it's been proven that pictures make a difference in children's life and adult life. And I have found that I have constant argument where people say, these videos with terrorists and guns, nah, that doesn't do anything. But I'm just wondering, when you start a child at an early age watching people be killed, watching guns go off, and then not expecting them to repeat this. Children learn so much from just seeing. And you mentioned about memory in there and repeated mm -hmm. things. Well, if you have a society around you with violence, uh, my question is, I can't see how all these professionals say the videos these movies, they don't have any effect on children. What do you think? Something that we learned early on in music, um, that the brain remembers everything we do when we practice. It remembers the good notes and the bad notes, because the brain can't distinguish the right notes from the wrong notes. And so we need to really practice accurately, because when we're under stress, that wrong note is going to sneak out. So the brain really does remember everything. So I agree with you that if we see some shocking, horrific video or pictures, on the internet or on the six o'clock news, that somewhere it goes to the back of our brain and it's always going to be there. And um, I share that concern, that I think that um, things are getting too graphic, especially for young children who can't always sort out the, the good from the bad. And um, they become almost immune to some things that they're seeing, that I forget the data, some of you may know this, how many shootings a youngster will have seen by the time they go to school because they've seen so many shootings on television. It's shocking. So I think that it's, um, it's a very valid concern and that our brains really do remember that, especially if it's a picture. So I share your concern. Thank you. Uh, a lot of what you said today sounded familiar. It looked a lot like my children are learning in their Montessori classrooms. I'm wondering if you could talk about what um, these new ideas are leaning from Montessori method and what the Montessori method can learn from our new understanding of uh, learning. Great question. Maria Montessori was an Italian medical doctor who was watching how children were learning and she realized that ch children really needed to actively engage with their environment in order to learn, so it was hands-on. So Maria Montessori built a lot of tactile things. We've got um, beads, we've got little cubes, we've got sorting and discriminating constantly because children learn through their fingers and through their environment and um, they need to construct their own understanding of their world through Montessori. So it's um, a very rich environment and um, they need to learn to take charge of that too. So well, we thought that was fine for um, Montessori and maybe for middle school or high school, but we need to switch gears when we get to college because we learn totally differently in college. Well, I don't think that's the case actually. But I think that we still need to have hands on. We still need to see pictures. We still need to keep our students engaged. We just can't say, I'm going to talk to you for two hours, and because you're in college, you have to pay attention, so let me start talking. Well, we can talk, but we know that it doesn't work, that they're checking out, and we can you know, hang the test over them. We require them to learn it, but then they have to go back and teach themselves, so we're not doing as much as we can to really engage them in the learning process. So, um, so yes. Yeah, um, Maybe college is kind of Montessori on steroids, but, um, <laughs> but I think that uh, you were catching what I was saying about active, hands-on engagement um, in college classrooms, too. But at a more sophisticated level, we're not playing with beads so much anymore.
Sounds like fun. I'm interested to know if you think that um, our tests and the way that they're structured are the most effective means of measurement, given the uh, new rules of instruction that we're talking about here. Is a written test or an oral exam or a final exam or something like exam like that? that you know, my wife uh, has a master's in teaching from Trinity recently. She's teaching uh, in the district here in San Antonio. And, you know, the, there's a lot of good instruction going on, but we still measure with the same yardstick. Mm -hmm. We sure do. Thanks, James. That's a, a really good point. I think we need to test a lot, but very low stakes tests, as I was talking about, formative tests, giving students and instructors lots of feedback in the classroom so they can measure how much um, they're mastering that, and to keep that going and so it doesn't become threatening. I'm not a fan, though, of the high stakes summative testing, which so much rides on it, whether a principal keeps his or her job, whether a child will pass on to the next grade level, where um, it's published in the paper about the scores for that school. These, this is high stakes testing. Students are now going home with tummy aches because they're so nervous about this high stakes testing. I'm not a fan of that, and I think that that really is doing our, our children a disservice. But I am a fan of lots of different ways of making testing informative, valuable, informal, um, lots of different ways, whether it be with the, the paper feedback or written or oral. That, that's all great, I think, because the more we learn about our learning and our learning style, the more we can learn that, I think. But um, the high stakes standardized tests, I think that's a real problem. And I think students are either, you take your pick, either engaged or distracted by technology, smartphones, tablets, computers. How does that impact the classroom and how, what can you do to, uh, to uh, when, you're, when you're teaching, use it either as a tool or, or come up with strategies so it doesn't uh, have a bad influence in, in what you're doing in the classroom? Technology is great that I use my iPhone, um, my iPad, my husband's nodding. I use um, my technology a lot, but it has to be um, just a way to get where I'm going. We need to figure out where we need to be at the end of the class or where we need to be at the end of a Trinity University education. And then we can use some technology to get us there, whether it's going to be the paper clickers or something more sophisticated. It's just a tool to get there. So it's not going to be we're going to use technology to um, just to use technology. It has to be for a really good reason. So I think it can be very engaging that right now my music education classes, we're using iPads to compose and we're using iPad Ensemble, which is, is really fun, but it's another tool about composing. We're also going to use ORF instruments and um, claves and really low low-tech things too. It's just another tool. So I don't want to say that all technology is distracting, although it really can be in the classroom. With that said though, I think too many of our children are coming to school and they've looked at too many screens. And I think that um, they're used to taking in the world through their screens and they're not able, as able to look you in the eye and learn from your eye contact and to really shake your hand because they're used to looking at a screen. And so they think if they get bored for a minute, where's my screen? Where's my iPad? Where's my, um, my iPhone? So I think that um, parents need to watch that, and, and we teachers need to watch it too, that we can't take in the whole world through a screen. We can learn about the world through a screen, but it really has to be, um, has to be moderated. Diane, I got a question that will speak to your experience as an, as an educator. Is there just a level of apathy within certain students that's impossible to broach, be it with multi-sensory learning or any method, uh, and you just need to cut your losses and try to move on? <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel there is a way to reach any students on any subject? It's just the matter of what teaching method you use. If you've ever worked with young children, you know that almost all young children love to learn. They can't wait to learn. They want to explore, and they want to touch, and they want to sort and discriminate. They want to talk about it. They want to debate. They just are intrigued. They're excited about learning and about the world. And if they have enough of this, 
the dopamine and the, the serotonin and they're going to really love learning. But if they get shut down a few times through hunger, through um, ineffective environments, environments that say, no, you can't learn, then they kind of get discouraged. And pretty soon it's like, oh my goodness, I think I'd rather play with my screens or I think I would rather play baseball because I've had too many negative experiences learning. So it's up to the college professor then to try to undo that negativity and to re-engage them. And I think we can. So I want that student in my hand, Belquer. I will re-engage. <laughs> I will re-engage that student because sometimes they, um, they do become a little bit apathetic and think, okay, try to teach me. I've had some really bad experiences. They might not be able to articulate that, but we can also tell by their body language that they're, they're getting a little discouraged by the whole by the whole education process. One last question. Um, I was I'm interested in your thoughts about um, this high stakes testing situation because I'm thinking about all of the um, times in real life where we really have to do that. Get into law school, SAT exams, med school, all sorts of uh, high stakes testing and I'm wondering um, First of all, feel that we should change all of that, or are, and if not, um, uh, how are the are students going to still be prepared to do, to do those kinds of tests? I think I'm a little older than you are, and I remember <laughs> back when I was little that one Friday morning the teacher would just say, Hey, we're doing the Iowa Basic test today. Okay, so we just all were herded into the auditorium. We take the Iowa Basics, and probably didn't even mention it to our folks that night. It was no big deal. And you know, we'd get our feedback, and the school then got that feedback about what was important to learn. And I guess that was really high stakes testing, but there was no pressure on it. It, um, it was just part of what we did. I think we got used to taking tests. And I knew that the ACT, the SAT tests were more high stakes, certainly, and so I wanted to be prepared for that. But it wasn't like this annual, I forget how many times our students are tested now in the classroom. It's, way more than once a year Iowa basics like it was back in the 14th century but it was um, <laughs> it was much more low, lower stakes it was much uh, much easier much, much more tolerable we have a lot more we have a lot more high stakes testing going now so I think you know, we, you're right we can't throw everything out that we really do need to prepare our students for taking some tests that, that are going to be really important and will impact their lives but there's so many of them now that it's, um, it's really kind of taken over. So, thank you. <laughs> I'll hear about it later. <laughs> Diane, our teachers were taught by the lecture system. They taught us through the lecture system. We taught through the lecture system. This morning I went to another university and received information via the lecture system. When will it change a lot? <laughs> I think it's changing slowly. I think that um, I think that Professor Blue Robes I think still exists and I think that we do have a lot of lecturing. I'd like to think that some lecturers are much better than others at, you know, every 10 minutes re-engaging. I hope that the lecture that you heard this morning at Grand Rounds, every 10 minutes they were re-engaging with a new thought, a new question, a, a new way to reboot. But I think that for a big group of students, college students, that there are additional tools in our toolkit that we can have. I think lecture is one really good way of, um, of sharing information. I think there are other ways too, and I think that we just can't have one single way. And that I think that it's going to um, work really well with you, as, um, but other students, they're going to check out after 10 minutes and say, this is a really exciting class, I really like what I'm hearing, I need to be more engaged, because I'm not following. So, so I'm seeing James is standing up, so I'm about to get the hook. <laughs> I've been hooked. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Everybody, please join me in.